Well, we come again to 1 Corinthians, looking at verse 20 and 21, these two verses in chapter 1. I would remind you that this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that he himself had planted a few years before, and then he had received word from a few people at this church that they had some big problems that needed to be dealt with. So Paul just writes a letter to them. He can't come in person as quickly as he needs to, so he writes down a letter, sends it to the church, and he has to deal with some pretty big issues that were being very divisive and that were dividing the church in general. Now he pauses in this letter after the introduction, and then he starts dealing with some of the big issues, like divisions in the church. They were being divided Some people were saying, I follow this teacher, I follow this teacher, I follow this teacher, and dividing themselves into little groups. Paul starts addressing that and then pauses to spend about a chapter and a half in our Bible and deals with the fact, the preaching of the gospel. He deals with the preaching of the gospel and how crucial it is, and that he did not preach the gospel just through worldly wisdom or with eloquent words of wisdom to them. He just preached it simply and plainly. This is how serious Paul takes the preaching of the gospel and the clarity of it, that he pauses the letter from the main things he's dealing with to say, we need to talk clearly about the gospel itself and why I preach the gospel in the way that I do. And so that's where we're at in this letter. It's an excursus. It's not the main point, but he steps to the side for a minute and says, I need to address these huge issues. And as he does it, he actually gets to another issue that the church at Corinth was dealing with. And it, it was something that pervaded the Corinthian society in general. And the issue that the church was dealing with and the whole society was that they prized, they praised, they adored men who could speak very wisely, and they could use eloquent words of wisdom. They prized the wisdom of the world and the philosophers of their day. They loved that, and they were thinking, it seems, that gospel preachers, Christ's ministers, should come, and they should preach the gospel with those same kind of words of lofty, philosophical, worldly wisdom And Paul's saying, no, that is not how gospel preachers come. That's how not that's not how God saves people, not through eloquent words of wisdom. Look with me in your own Bible at verse 17 again, and then we'll build right back up to where we are currently in verse 20. Paul had previously said, I thank God that he didn't send me to baptize. I didn't baptize more of you, but I only baptized a few of you. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize. Baptize in water. That's not the primary reason he sent me. But to preach the gospel. And not, and now he's qualifying it. He sent me to preach the gospel, but he didn't send me to do it with eloquent words of wisdom. Just as the people in Corinth, the philosophers, the worldly wise men did. No, God didn't send me, Christ didn't send me to preach the gospel with eloquent words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Verse 18 For, because the word of the cross, that means the message of the gospel of Christ crucified in place of sinners like us, it's folly to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to those who are not saved through believing its message. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, he's quoting Isaiah 29, 14, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. This is what the Lord's saying. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And so do you see where we are so far in this letter to the church at Corinth? Paul says, Christ sent me to preach the good news of Christ crucified and risen from the dead to save sinners plainly, simply, not wrapped in words of philosophy or worldly wisdom. He hasn't sent me for that because 
This word of the cross, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, in verse 20, Paul specifically names three different groups of people, one in general, and then two in particular, and basically says, where are these people? Where are these people? Can they do anything to save you? This is why I don't preach the gospel with worldly wisdom or philosophy or any of that, because people have been doing that for centuries, and it can't save anyone from their sin. People have been preaching worldly wisdom for a long time, even before Paul, and he said, it can't save you from your sin. The scribes who are experts in the law and can tell you this is how you must obey the law, they can't save you from your sin. They can't tell you the message by which you can be forgiven by God. The debaters of this age, the Greek philosophers, they can't save you from your sin. That's what he's doing when he says, where is the one who is wise? Look at verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? What that means is, has not God revealed that those who are wise according to the world's standards, those who are experts in the law of God, and those who are great Greek philosophers, has not God revealed that they are foolish? Because they can't do anything to deal with your sin? They can't actually tackle the biggest problems you have? Hasn't God shown that they are foolish? That's what he means by, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. For since that is true, since the world cannot know God experientially, cannot be reconciled to God, can't be forgiven of their sin through worldly wisdom, it pleased God. Look at it. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So here, here are the main points of this passage and how we're going to walk through it and divide it up. First, God has made foolish the worldly wise because salvation does not come through their wisdom. God has revealed, rendered as foolishness the wisdom of the world because salvation from sin and death does not come through their wisdom. Second, God has made foolish the scribe. This is the experts in the Old Testament law. God has made foolish the scribe because salvation does not come through the law. Third, God has made foolish the debater of this age because salvation does not come through their philosophy. And then fourth and finally, it pleased God to save his people simply through the preaching of the gospel. Well, that's where we're going. That's what this text teaches. So now start with me and think about this very first part when Paul says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? And then has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? This helps us realize that Paul's talking about when he says, where is the one who is wise? He's talking about those who are wise according to worldly standards and worldly wisdom and not according to what God has revealed in the Scriptures. It's as simple as that. They are very wise. They seem to have a great deal of wisdom, but it's not according to Christ. It's not according to God's revelation in the Bible. It's just according to their own experience or their own intellect. A great example of this, where is the one who is wise? A great example of this modern day is a man named Jordan Peterson. And some of you may know who Jordan Peterson is, some of you may not. He's a clinical psychologist from Canada who a few years ago just burst onto the scene because, in my estimation, he gets a lot of things right. He speaks from his experience as a psychologist and he reads the Bible some, but he doesn't believe it's the Word of God. But in his experience, what he's seen just with human beings 
and his deductions that he makes, it, a lot of times he gets stuff right as far as what the Bible says, though he doesn't depend on the Bible to be his authority. He has a lot of worldly wise things to say, but Jordan Peterson can't tell you how to have your sins forgiven. Jordan Peterson can maybe help you clean your room or take some responsibility for yourself and not be such what, what he would call a worthless member of society. He can maybe help you with that. He can't deal with your biggest problems. That's, this is the same type thing when Paul says, where's the one who is wise? He's just speaking in general here. Where's the worldly wise man? God's made them foolish. Because... In that wisdom, in the worldly wisdom, that can't give you true access and reconciliation to God. That's why God has made it foolish. What you'll notice if you ever read any of Jordan Peterson is that he usually gets the problems right so just through his experience, through looking at human beings and their depravity, our enslavement to sin, though he wouldn't call it that. He, a lot of times he puts his finger on the problem. And then when he tries to give the answer to that problem, he's a million light years from the truth. He gets the problem that mankind is sinful and we're all capable of great evil. And then he says the remedy to that is do more, try harder, be a better person. I'm like, nope, that's not the remedy. That's not the gospel. So in the end, men like Peterson, though they can be helpful to some only in a worldly sense, they can't deliver us, they can't let us know how to deal with our real problems. The fact that I've offended God through my sin, and I need God to be reconciled to me. I need to be cleansed. I need to be counted righteous. I need to receive not only new standards to live by, I need to receive a new heart that loves the Lord and wants to obey Him. How sad would it be to have a clean room, but spend an eternity in hell? That's what you'll get through listening to worldly wise men like Peterson. I pray God would save him. How horrible to take responsibility for everything in your life, according to the wisdom of the world, except how to be forgiven and counted righteous before God. God has made foolish the worldly wise because salvation doesn't come through their wisdom. That's the first general point. Now, what I think Paul is doing here in these verses, he makes a general statement about the wisdom of the world. Where is the generally wise people in the world? God's made them foolish because they can't tell you how to be saved. And then he goes after the Jewish wise men, those who the Jews would think are the experts in wisdom, and he attacks them and says, they can't save you either. They can't help you be saved. And then he turns next to the Greeks, the Gentiles, the philosophers in Greece, and says, these people, the debaters of this age, they can't do anything for you either. So general worldly wisdom cannot tell you how to be forgiven and reconciled to God. And then he goes after the Jews next. Look at that. When he says, where is the scribe? Where is the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? And all this applies to the wise scribe debater of this age when he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. The scribes in Jewish culture were those who had memorized most, if not all, of the Old Testament of our Bible. They had memorized the 620 plus laws of God revealed in the Old Testament, and then, according to their own human wisdom, not according to what God says in His Word, they said, if you are very careful to obey all of these laws, God will love you, You'll be a part of his family. This is how you can be accepted to God, through obeying the law strictly. So these scribes, because they had convinced people that they could be saved through their law keeping, they were seen as the most wise men in the land because they knew the law better than anyone else. 
But Paul calls them forward and says, where is the scribe? Where is the expert in the law? God has revealed that they are foolish. Because God does not save us through our obedience. God does not save us through our law keeping. This is why they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. The scribes, the experts in the law, rejected Christ when he came and essentially said, you cannot save yourself. You must trust in me and me alone to deliver you from your sin. Only I can set you free. And they didn't like him. They didn't like that he fellowshiped with tax collectors and sinners and offered them grace and forgiveness. He didn't like that he preached a salvation by grace alone. They didn't like that, so they hated him. And this is what Jesus said to them in Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you. That means a curse be upon you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, means actors. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. This is what the scribes were like who thought by their external obedience to the commands of God in the law, they could be made right with God and be reckoned as righteous before Him. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're like a grave. Yes, on the outside it's been washed white, it's been painted white, and it looks clear, but inside of you are dead men's bones. You're spiritually dead. Why does Jesus say that? It's because the law cannot save you. The scribe who is the expert in the law cannot help you be forgiven of your sin. Galatians 3.10. I don't think it gets any clearer than this when it comes to the law of God and its function in our lives. We cannot be saved by it. Galatians 3.10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on their obedience to the law are under a curse. For it is written... Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The only way you can be saved through the law is if you have obeyed every law perfectly every minute of every day. And you haven't. Neither have I. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has obeyed in such a way. Therefore, the law cannot save you. The scribe, according to their worldly wisdom, trying to use the law of God in a way that's unlawful. Trying to use the law of God to say, this is how God will accept you. No, where is the scribe? God's rendered them foolish. First of all, in our lives, the law of God is a mirror to expose our sin. You mark that down for yourself. The law of God is a mirror, first of all, to expose your sin. You look into the perfect law of God, the commands of God that are according to His perfect holiness, His perfect nature. He commands us in His Word. It First of all, we look into it as a mirror and see, I have not done that. Even when I've tried really hard, I have not done that as I should. So the law of God is a mirror that exposes our sin and that we need to be cleansed of our sin by the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. That's what the law is first. If you try, if you try to break up the law into manageable pieces and say, well, I can obey this and this and this and this really well, and then God must owe me his love all you're doing is breaking up a mirror into many pieces and using these shards of glass to try to scrub filth away. You're not going to clean yourself through broken glass. It doesn't work. Glass doesn't clean away filth. It only reveals it. 
this glass of the law of God, what the scribes were experts in, the scribes should have been experts in saying, you're not righteous, you're not righteous, you need Jesus, I'm not righteous, I need Jesus, you're not righteous, you don't obey this, this, this. An expert in the law could be a great thing because it helps us all realize we have not obeyed how we should. We have all rebelled against God and we need Him to cleanse us through His Son's work in our place. But these scribes didn't do that. They tried to tell people, take the glass and scrape your flesh off and that will clean up your sin. All you're going to do is harm yourself. Boys and girls, children, look at me. Can you imagine if you get really dirty outside and you've got mud all over you and you need to go get in the bath to clean it up? How silly would it be for you to take a bunch of broken pieces of glass with you into the bathtub? Maybe your mom and dad give you a big bucket and it's just a bunch of broken glass that's sharp and will cut you. And they say, okay, use this glass to clean all the mud off of yourself. You should say, no, that's not why we use glass. I need some soap. I need something that will actually help clean away all the dirt that's attached to me. Not something that's just going to cut me up. Boys and girls, the law of God is like that glass. The commands of God are like that glass. They can't clean you up. You being very obedient and trying very hard to obey God, that cannot wash your sin away. Only Jesus Christ and Him dying in your place. Only you trusting in Jesus, boys and girls, can truly be that soap that cleanses you of your sin. Adults, do you know that too? Do you know that when you try to obey so that God will be pleased with you ultimately, uh, I'm going to earn God's favor, put God in my debt through your obedience to the law, all you're doing is cutting yourself with broken glass? God only cleanses of sin through the blood of Christ. That is the soap that washes our sin away. And that's why Paul says, where is the scribe? They've been trying since the delivery of the law. Experts in the law have got it wrong and been trying to tell you, if you are very obedient, God will accept you as righteous. Hasn't God shown that the experts in law are just foolish because they can't actually help you. You cannot make God forgive you. You cannot make God love you by being very obedient. You must trust in the Lord Jesus alone and in what he's done. That's how God forgives. Therefore, see that God has made foolish those who think that through their works, they can earn God's love. Those who depend on their works are under a curse. See how foolish we are. When we base our acceptance with God in our justification or in our sanctification, based on our works rather than the perfect works of Jesus. See our foolishness. See that those who try and obey well enough to put God in their debt all they are doing is placing themselves under a curse. How about you? Do you depend on your obedience, your works, or that you are trying your best, and therefore God should accept you? Is that how you live your life? I don't mean is that what you would write down on paper for a test. I mean, is that your experience? Is that how you live your life? My obedience determines whether or not God loves me today. How well I keep the law today determines how happy and pleased God is with me tomorrow. If you live your life by that, you're not living according to the gospel. You're living according to the scribes. God does not love you because you keep the law. God loves you because you are clothed in Christ Jesus. 
if indeed your faith is in Jesus. God has made foolish the scribe. But God has not only shown that the wisest among the Jews have been made foolish, he also says through Paul that the wisest among the Greeks, the heathens, the philosophers, those who totally outright reject the scriptures, they're they're wise men. He shows that they have been rendered as foolish as well. Look at when he says the next part of verse 20. Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God has made foolish the debater of this age because salvation does not come through philosophy. It seems who Paul's talking about is the sophists or others like them. And a sophist, all that was is in this time, it was a paid teacher of philosophy and rhetoric in ancient Greece. They are associated in popular thought with being very skeptical and superficially plausibly reasoning arguments. They love to say, yes, I see what you're saying, but what about this? Yes, that, but what about this? And just an endless amount of plausible or possible conclusions, and they based everything on their moral skepticism and reasoning. They were a paid teacher of philosophy. This is who Paul is going after. He went after the wise men of the Jews. They can't help you. Now he's going after the wise men of the Greeks. The same type men that would be in Corinth. The same type men that Paul encountered when he went to Athens. In Acts 17, 21 and 32, when Paul comes against these kind of people, he comes to preach the gospel to them. Luke writes in Acts 17, Now all the Athenians, those who lived in Athens, and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. All they wanted to do was hear about some new idea, some new thing, some new philosophy that someone could present. And so Paul sees what they're doing out there and goes to the middle of the city in Athens and preaches the gospel to them. And after he preaches Christ, verse 32 says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked. It means they they just made fun of Paul. They made fun of his preaching of Christ, that he was crucified to forgive us of our sin, that he was raised from the dead to life to be our Savior. Said some of them, these debaters of this age, they just mocked when they heard the gospel. God has made foolish their philosophy because they can't tell you how to be saved. Now, Calvin says in conclusion of these three things, wise, scribe, debater of this age, Calvin says, thus in a general way, Paul brings to nothing man's entire intellect. That's what Paul's doing here, is bringing to nothing man's entire intellect so far as it works in order to save us from our sin. You want to depend on your intellect? Can't get there. You can't get saved through that. You can't figure it out by human wisdom. So what does this mean for you and I? It means that through the wisdom that the world offers, you need to make sure that you've got this marked down clearly in your mind. Through the wisdom that the world offers, your biggest problems cannot be dealt with. Through the wisdom the world offers, they may be able to help with little temporary problems in your life, but your biggest problems cannot be dealt with through scribes or through philosophy. If you gather all of the wise medicines of every learned man who ever lived, it will not be able to heal you from the plague of sin. That's what Paul's getting at. Where are all these people? What have they been able to do for you? Nothing. 
God is revealed they are foolish. Children, boys and girls, the world cannot give you what will make you happy. The world cannot give you what will make you happy. Only Jesus can give you what will make you happy. Only Jesus can take your sin away. Only Jesus can reconcile you to Himself. That means make peace between you and Him. The world can't give it to you. They can't give you the medicine that you need. Next, see how foolish you are if you look for rescue. See how foolish you are if you look for rescue or peace or happiness in philosophers, sociologists, psychologists, economists, scientists, or civil authorities? Do you look for rescue or peace or happiness in philosophers? Do you look for those things in sociologists? Do you look for them in psychologists? Do you look for rescue or peace or happiness in economists, in scientists, or in civil authorities? If we just get in the right Supreme Court, if we just get the right president, you hope in that? You put your happiness in that? You look for rescue in that or peace in that? See how foolish you are. They can't give you what you ultimately need. Next. See that you must not trust in wisdom from those who do not submit to Christ. You must not trust in any wisdom unless it's given to you by someone who submits to Christ and His Word, no matter how clever they may be. If the wisdom that's presented is not founded in the Scriptures and in Christ crucified, it's foolishness. You can search diligently for all the wisdom this world has to offer. You can sit at the feet of Plato, follow the teachings of Aristotle, diligently ponder Socrates, or heed every piece of life advice from Jordan Peterson or Dave Ramsey, and it will not deliver you from your sin. You will not be able to find out how to be rescued and how to be happy in Christ. Now look at verse 21. Now that Paul has outlined for us the things that God has rendered as foolishness, he then says the simple truth. The simple truth that must guide every day of our life. It guides every Sunday when we gather together for worship. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through that wisdom, It pleased God. It made God happy. Through the folly of what we preach, or through the foolishness of preaching, to save those who believe. It pleased God to save His people through the preaching of the gospel. Through the proclamation of this simple message, friends. This is what Paul's saying. Though... You have rebelled against God, and you deserve nothing but His judgment and wrath. God sent His only Son into the world, who became a man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life you have not lived. He died the death you deserve to die. He was buried, and then three days later, He was raised from the dead. So that everyone who trusts in Him will be forgiven of their sin, reconciled to God, counted righteous, be preserved for the rest of their life, and be perfected one day when they die or when Jesus comes back. That's how God saves. Not through philosophy. Not through worldly wisdom, but through that plain message. You need to hear, this is how God delivers sinners. Christ was crucified. Come and trust in him for forgiveness of sins and be reconciled to God. The world looks at that simple message and says, you think 
just a few sentences can do any good to anyone. And what all of you know in this room who truly do trust in Jesus, what all of you true Christians know is yes. (laughs) It's through that simple message that Christ died in my place, that God transformed my life. He gave me assurance that all my sins have been paid for. It's through that simple message that Paul says, all these other things couldn't work, but it pleased God through what people say, well, it's just foolishness. Preaching the gospel, that's foolishness. That's what Paul's getting at. To save everyone who believes, who trusts in Jesus. I want you to think for a second, why does he say preaching is folly? Well, of course, he means that those who do not believe, who rather trust in worldly wisdom, scribes, debaters, they see the preaching of the gospel as folly. It's not actually foolishness, but those who are worldly wise look at it and say, that's foolishness. That's what he means. What they call foolishness, that's how God saves us. That's what he's getting at. What he means is, in the world's eyes, those who proclaim the gospel will always be seen as foolish. Think with me. Back to the book of Genesis. When for 120 years, Noah built the ark of God. Why? Because God said, I'm going to destroy all living things on the earth for their sin. So build an ark, and I'm going to save you through it. So Moses is a preacher of righteousness, a herald of righteousness for 120 years as he built the ark. Did he not warn others to flee from the wrath to come? For 120 years, did he not herald the truth and warn sinners to flee and God's judgment is coming? Yet what did the world think of him? They thought of him as a fool. What is rain? Who is this God you say is going to bring judgment on us? Noah, as a herald of righteousness, was considered as a fool to the entire world. Yet I ask you simply, who was saved? It was Noah and his family. Think back 1900 years ago in AD 66 when the Christians in Jerusalem fled that city and went to the mountains outside in Israel because Jesus had said, when you see these signs happen, flee to the mountains so that you're not killed. That's what he says in his Olivet Discourse. He says, when you see these certain things happen, you need to flee to the mountains so you're not all destroyed. So, when Rome started surrounding Jerusalem in AD 66... All of the Christians who trusted what God had said to them and his son, Jesus Christ, warned other people and said, we got to get out of Jerusalem. Because Jesus told us when we see these things happening, we got to leave immediately or we're going to be destroyed. Those that they warned about the destruction coming on Jerusalem thought they were fools. And so... Thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews living in Jerusalem who didn't listen to the warnings of those early Christians, they were slaughtered when Titus sacked Jerusalem in AD 70. You know what the records tell us? Church history tells us not one Christian stayed in Jerusalem. Not one Christian was killed because they all said, Jesus warned us, to flee from the wrath to come when we see these signs, so we're going to the mountains. They were considered as fools when they warned people that Rome was going to destroy the city. But who was saved? The ones who were regarded as fools were the ones who were saved. Here's what Paul is saying here, and here's what these examples show us. The preaching of Christ crucified... The simple message of the gospel 
is that great spiritual defibrillator, defibrillator that God uses to make dead sinners come to life. The preaching of the gospel is the great spiritual defibrillator that God uses to make dead sinners come to life and cling to Christ by faith. You know what a defibrillator is? Have you ever seen one? I've only seen it in the movies. But I know many of you have seen them. Some of you probably used them. Clear. Pump electricity into someone. Shock them so that their heart starts beating again. Can you just imagine how foolish, if someone didn't understand what those paddles do in trying to get someone's heart to start beating again when they code? Can you imagine how foolish it would look to someone else who didn't understand what those were for? Like Their heart stopped beating. Why do you have these paddles that you're putting on them? Their body just jolted up. What are you doing? It looks foolish unless you understand that that is the means by which a heart that has stopped beating can start beating again. That's how people look at the gospel. You think someone can be changed and transformed and enlightened and forgiven through the simple message of preaching the gospel? Only people who talk like that are those who don't understand what God does when his good news is preached. He saves sinners. It pleased God to save his people through preaching. Boys and girls, children, for the very last time, look at me. Listen to me. You must learn how to listen to your parents when they're teaching you the Bible. You must learn how to sit still and listen to your parents as they're preaching the good news of Jesus to you in family worship. Children, you must learn, as you've been doing so well, how to sit still and listen when one of your pastors is preaching the gospel to you. Because, children, through the preaching of the good news of Jesus, that's how God will save you. That's how God will make you happy. That's how God will change you to be happier and more holy in Jesus. Adults, some of you still maybe haven't even learned that lesson. To pay diligent attention when the Word of God is being proclaimed. Do you see in this passage? Paul says, that is the means that God uses to save sinners. That's also the means, believers, that's the means that God uses to transform you. To give you assurance. To help you to fight your sin. The preaching of the Word of God is how God saves. Therefore, by way of application, in conclusion, let me say these few things to you. You need to see in this passage that all you need to do in order to be saved from your sin is believe. That's it. Hear the good news of Christ and trust in Him. Look at it again. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, this is verse 21, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who, what? Believe. That's how God saves. We hear the message of Christ, and believe means to trust in Him, to lean upon Him, to put your confidence in Him. You want to be forgiven of your sin? Cling to Christ, trust in Christ in faith, and you'll be saved. Second, see how humble we should be who have been saved. Are you humble? If you're a Christian, you must be. It's not because of our wisdom, nor because of excellent scribes or debaters that we are saved. If you're in Christ, it's because God saved you as you heard the gospel. He opened your eyes to see it. He opened your ears to hear it. He gave you a new heart that would want to trust in Jesus by faith. See how humble we should be. We're not better than anyone or anything We've been saved because this is how it pleased God to save us. We heard, and he gave us the gift of faith. Third, see that 
you who will faithfully preach the gospel will be regarded as fools. If you want to faithfully preach the gospel, not just in a formal sense like I'm doing now, but in an informal way, proclaiming the good news to your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, to the ends of the earth, see that you, you need to be prepared to be seen by the world as a fool. You see, I mean, just remember the play on words. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Because those outside just look at it as foolishness. Are you prepared to be seen by the world as foolish? If you're not prepared for that, you won't be much use to anybody. If you want to be seen by those who don't love Jesus as this wise, excellent person, and you're not prepared to be seen by a fool as a fool, you're not going to be much use. Paul was ready and willing, and he embraced it. He says, I know you guys see me as a fool. I know you see me as foolishness, yet it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach. You guys who could do nothing, it pleased God to save those who believe. You who want to be in pastoral ministry, get ready to be looked on as a fool. Do you want to be a faithful gospel preacher, proclaimer? You want to share the gospel with your neighbors? Many will think you're foolish. Fourth, in application, see how you can do others the most good. Preach the gospel to them. You want to love your neighbor as yourself? You want to do the most good to people? Tell them the good news of what Christ has done for us. Exhort them to respond through turning from their sin and trusting in Jesus. That's how you can do the most good. Husbands and fathers, do you want to do the most good to your wife and your children? Preach the gospel. Mothers, do you want to do the most good that you possibly can to your kids? Tell them of Christ crucified. All the rest of you, any of you, do you want to do your friends and neighbors and family the most good? Tell them the plain message of Christ and let them know you must respond. You must trust in Jesus and submit to him. That's how God delivers sinners. Fifth and finally, looking at what God says here in his word in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21, see that you must never despise preaching. You must never despise the preaching of God's word. Oh, how many of God's people come sleepily to church and sleep in the midst of the sermon. How many of you children, when it's time for family worship, for your father or maybe your mother to teach you the Bible, you can only think of doing something else but you don't want to hear. It's to our shame that we do not pay diligent, careful attention every time the Word of God is proclaimed. It is through this means that God saves and sanctifies His people. Do you neglect it in the least? See that you must never despise preaching. Thomas Watson, who's my favorite Puritan, as some of you well know, in one of his sermons gives us these encouragements for how we must hear the Word of God preached. And I close with these. Give great attention to the Word preached. Give great attention. Be laser-focused on the preaching of God's Word. Next, come with a holy appetite to the Word. Come hungry and ready to be fed God's Word. Come to it with tenderness upon your heart. Not saying, I already know what I should know, but saying, I'm weak. I stumble in many ways. God, show me how I'm wrong. Show me what I need to see. Next, Watson says, receive it with meekness, with humbleness. 
knowing all I am is a man. All I am on my own is someone in need of God's mercy. So God, please speak to me. Fifth, Watson says, mingle the word preached with faith. What he means is, as you hear the word of God preached, receive it, pay attention to it, and believe it as what it really is. It's God's word being spoken to us. Receive it, mingle it with faith and trust. Sixth, Watson says, be not only attentive in hearing, but retentive after hearing. What he means is don't only pay attention when you hear the word preached, but think about it. Write down what you've heard. Remember what you've heard preached. Retain it after you've heard. Seventh, he says, reduce your hearing to practice. What he means is what James says. Don't only be a hearer of the word of God, but think as you hear the word of God preached to you, how does this change how I think and how I should live? And resolve to live according to what God says in his word. Reduce your hearing to practice. Eighth, he says, beg of God that he will accompany his word with his presence and blessing. When you hear the word of God preached, beg God, plead with God in prayer that he will bless you through the hearing of the word, that he'll deposit it in your soul, and that you will sense his very presence. Ninth and finally, Watson says, make it familiar to you. And by that he means have conversations with other people about what you have heard preached from the word of God. These ways I commend to you. Give great attention. Come with a holy appetite. Come to it with tenderness. Receive it with meekness. Mingle it with faith. Don't only be attentive in hearing, but retentive after hearing. Reduce your hearing to practice. Beg of God that he will accompany his word with his presence and blessing. And make your conversations be saturated with what you've heard preached from God's word. So I read just as my last words, read this again. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Amen? Pray with me. Our Father, we thank you that we do not have to depend on worldly wisdom or worldly philosophy, but we can depend on Christ alone, his word alone, as preached in the gospel. We thank you for saving us simply through our hearing the good news of what Christ has done and through trusting in him. Help us to not depend on anything that is based and founded in worldly wisdom. Help us to look at the law as we should, not as a way to be saved, but as a way to reveal that we need to be saved. Help us to put all kind of wise sayings in their proper place. Help us to be faithful to preach the gospel simply and accurately. We want to be people who don't try to wrap the gospel with worldly wisdom or anything like that. We want to be plain speakers of your truth. And we ask you to save people. Save sinners through the folly of what we preach. Help them come to faith in Jesus alone. We ask you to purify your church, to help us to worship you now, All of these ways, help us to offer them up to you as sacrifices of praise. Purify your church, abolish abortion, rescue our pre-born neighbors that are being carried off to death, save sinners, and sanctify your saints. We ask it in Christ's name alone. Amen.